field hearing, and that is that they can detect changes in movement of air molecules that come from nearby sound sources. So, however, as you move further from a sound source, uh, this air molecule movement is thought to become negligibly small. And this type of sensor is thought to not work in what is called the far field. But the far field is full of many useful sounds in an environment, like the sounds of the same prey that we were just talking about, but located further away in space. Um, and also the songs of nearby predators or habitat cues, like the sounds of running water. And there's at least some evidence that spiders can detect bird song. A study in animal behavior showed that these lycosids can distinguish predatory bird song from other control sounds. Um, in this case, it seems that the spiders are able to detect the airborne sound only through substratum board vibration. So the airborne sound gets transduced into the substrate. And so it's not truly far field hearing in this case. However, recently um, there was a discovery that the salticid responded to low frequency sounds in the far field, so beyond three meters. Um, the organ responsible for this perception is unknown, but the researchers suggest that it's highly sensitive hair receptors and that particle movement might not be as negligible as we once thought. So some spiders might be able to hear. Um, even more recently, there was a paper in PNAS that looks at the ability of spider silk to transduce airborne sounds into web vibration. So I'm gonna take a, a minute to explain this. On the x-axis here, we have a frequency of sound. So you might, have, you might think about this as pitch um, for human perception. And this ranges from infrasound on the left to ultrasound on the right, uh, with an elephant and a bat respectively to guide those who are a little more visually oriented. And the y-axis is a measure of uh, silk movement relative to the background sound. Um, so for comparison, this yellow line here is a uh, a human-made sensor, roughly spanning the range of human hearing. The pink line is a cricket Circe hair, and this blue line at the top is the performance of the spider silk. So the fact that this blue line is flat all the way across from infrasound to ultrasound means that the spider silk nearly perfectly transduces sound to vibration um, from about one hertz to 50,000 hertz in this case. And so this is far better than any microphone we've ever built. Um, so it's possible that these spiders are using orb webs as basically giant ears that allow them to feel the acoustic environment. And so this may allow spiders to perceive potentially a much larger world than we typically think about. Um, so river sounds, for example, produce a large amount of acoustic energy and one can imagine that in a dry desert landscape, being able to perceive sounds from a nearby stream might help inform dispersal or habitat selection decisions. Especially for a couple of spiders that are potentially riparian specialists or that seem to be found in close connection with streams. And so I study the effects of river noise with these two orb weavers, Tetragnatha versicolor um, of the family Tetragnathidae and Lorenioides bategiatus of the family Arenidae, which were conveniently the only two orb weaving species that I ever found near these streams in the Pioneer Mountains of Idaho. Um, so I'm interested in this question of does river noise structure orb weaver abundance as measured from these transects um, along the streams, behavior as measured by orb weaving uh, web building behavior, so if spiders do use the webs for perceiving the acoustic environment, we might expect some changes to that structure and body condition as measured by the residual mass index. And this is thought to be some sort of proxy for fitness. So any natural experiment by itself is just correlational. And so we can't be sure of any correlated latent variables that might be driving patterns outside of the effects of the river noise itself. And so our team uh, on a much larger project, sort of this was fit inside of that, hiked roughly four tons of gear into the Pioneer Mountains of Idaho um, so that we could continuously experimentally alter river noise for the duration of each summer, day and night um, for three years. And I then monitored spiders at 78 sampling locations within 15 acoustically independent sites. So what did I find? 
So here is a plot of spider abundance on the Y in relation to sound pressure level on the X axis, which is me measured in decibels. So the points are raw data from the 117 transects color coded for the two different species. And lines are model draws from generalized linear mixed effects models done in a Bayesian framework. So that is the lines are the predicted response of spider abundance relative to sound pressure level while including all the other variables in the model. And so you can see that as places get louder, there are far more spiders for both species. Now, if we look at the estimates, so this is from the same model, but it's showing all other variables from that model, all the other estimates and um, uh, certainty around those estimates. We can, we can look at how all these sort of variables compare to one another because they're all standardized. And so the effect sizes here are directly comparable. And so if any of these estimates are on the right hand side, you expect to see more spiders as, as that unit or that variable increases. So I've indicated that with three spider silhouettes on the right, whereas there's one on the left hand side, which would indicate uh, smaller abundances. And so the thin lines here are 95% credible intervals, and the thick lines are 80% credible intervals. And so uh, sound pressure up here at the top, um, you can see is, is actually has the strongest effect out of all these other variables. It's even a stronger predictor um, than stream width, elevation, temperature, and that's indicated by being the furthest from zero here. Um, so here's a similar plot. Um, but for the total catch area of 190 webs. And so you can see that uh, Larinioides here in red has a pretty strong decline of web catch area as sound pressure level gets higher, whereas the Tetragnatha really have a pretty weak effect, if, if no effect at all. Um, and so then we can look at the uh, effect size plots uh, in the silhouettes again indicate on the right, uh, much bigger webs, larger catch area, and on the left, smaller. And so you can see down here that Larinioides uh, build much smaller webs as we sort of expect by looking at that previous plot. Um, in Tetragnatha trend in this direction, but they, they're still overlapping at the 80% credible interval. So that's uh, not so certain. Um, and th those, those species are more affected by things like ordinal date. So, so that the further along you get in the year, the bigger webs they seem to build. Um, so if we look at body condition, uh, you can note the silhouettes again uh, indicate there's a much larger abdomen here, so much better body condition to the right, uh, much worse body condition to the left. That most of these variables are not reliably altering body condition, um, including sound pressure level. There seems to be a, a, a positive trend for Larinioides. There's nearly a 91% probability that this effect is positive uh, in this Bayesian framework, but it's not conclusive. Um, and this, if, if this pattern is consistent and real, it, it may make sense considering they're also building smaller webs, so there might be some sort of energetic trade-off there. So sort of revisiting the questions, you know, does river noise structure uh, abundance? I would say yes, absolutely. It, it structures abundance for both uh, species we were looking at. And the other one's behavior sometimes uh, for Larinioides, but probably not for the other uh, tetric method. And, and for body condition, uh, may, maybe, probably not, not strongly. And so after finding you know, these pretty interesting results, I thought of the, the noise really increasing the abundance of spiders because most species of, of vertebrates and um, arthropods that have been tested in noise seem to decline. Everything sorts, seems to avoid noise. And so I really begin to ask why, why do we see these changes? And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on some other data and some future directions to try to understand the mechanisms behind some of these patterns. And so one possibility- I have 10 minutes now, so just while you paused there, okay? Go ahead. Uh, one possibility is that spiders are directly responding to the rivers as a sensory cue. And so there are a lot of different ways to test that, um, and that's probably in the future, but you know, naive juveniles to see if they're attracted and, and things like that. Um, but it's also important to remember that 
that spiders exist in a web of interaction. So it's possible that prey capture is positively affected by noise and this indirectly affects orb weavers. So similarly, it's also possible that their predators avoid noise and this makes spiders more likely to survive. So the direct effects, like I said, I have not measured yet. So I'll put a question mark on this one for now. But I did, however, count and identify prey captured in webs. So here's a similar plot um, where sound pressure level is here at the bottom. And we likely see positive effects of sound levels on tetragnathid uh, prey capture rates, which is possibly what we'd expect considering that these spiders are more abundant. Um, and Lorinioides, in fact, did the opposite, even though they're more abundant. So it seems that prey capture probably cannot fully explain the patterns we see, at least for Lorinioides. Um, but an important caveat here is that whatever measured in a web is not exactly what the spiders are eating, but actually sort of the opposite of that, right? They're, but this might still serve as sort of a useful metric of prey avail availability, but it is sort of skewed because you miss the things that the spiders truly prefer to eat. So returning to this diagram, I've added an arrow up for Tetragnatha indicating that there's an indirect um, effect that, that sh would be predicted to increase the abundance of tetragnatha, which is what we actually find, so it's underlined, um, whereas the opposite is true for Lernioides. So now looking at uh, vertebrate predators in the same area, they decline significantly as sound pressure levels increase. And both songbirds and bats at our sites have been found with these or similar species of orb, we orb weavers in their diet, um, so it's possible that these orb weaving spiders are more abundant in loud areas because they simply have fewer predators. And there's a big caveat here that we don't really know how much these spiders are being eaten by these predators because a lot of diet analyses can't really accurately um, give you abundance, but there's at least presence of those um, in that diet. And so for a lot of current work, I'm, I'm using mark recapture to monitor spider survival in these gradients of river noise to try and better tie these pieces together. So the bird and bat predator data suggests that both species should increase, which is what they actually do, as indicated by the underlined um, yellow letters T and L book going on. So in summary, river noise can't change orb weaver behavior and certainly alters abundance, which is pretty interesting. And so they might be perceiving a much larger sort of soundscape or acoustic environment than we previously thought. And as for mechanisms, we're not really sure about the direct effects and we have some ideas how to test it, but our data on indirect effects via both bottom up and top down forces suggests that both of these mechanisms are, are plausibly causing or, or pushing some of these patterns in those directions, but there are a lot of unknowns still. Um, so with that, thank you very much for listening and I'll take any questions. Great, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, I think you mostly addressed, um, there are a lot of questions about the, the sort of the correlations between prey availability and uh, you were talking mostly about the direct effects and indirect effects towards the end. So these may have come before you addressed that, but um, can you just recap real quickly what, whether you think there's a correlation between the noise and emergent insects from the, from the river? Yeah, so um, there, there seems to be a, a bit more prey capture or an increase in prey capture for just one of the species, the tetragnathids, but, but not as much for the other one. And, and we, we sampled insects with a lot of different traps. So this was, um, like I said in the beginning, this was part of a much bigger project. So we, we studied birds, bats, and insects with UV bucket traps, pitfalls, uh, malaise traps, and all these other things. But spiders weren't initially a part of it, and I sort of took that and, and, and added the spider part. And so we don't have a lot of good data for emerging aquatic insects, unfortunately. Um, but most of, the, most of the insects actually in these webs were dipterans, and they, they don't seem to be affected by the river noise broadly at that order level. But um, we're still working on trying to get a little bit more, uh, a higher taxonomic resolution to see if there might be some links there. And, um, I've been sequencing a bunch of bird, uh, bird poop to see if, if these actual species are showing up and in which species of birds they might be showing up in to try to, try to look at those food webs a little more closely. And when you, when you look at um, density of spiders, you also, especially with web spiders, you also have the 
the complication of the structure of the habitat? Um, mm -hmm. And did you control for, you know, so sort of website possibilities across these habitats for the spiders? Yeah, um, the, the only thing I can, that I really controlled for it in, in that sense was, so there's a, with GIS, we did a little bit of, of riparian veg sort of stuff, which is obviously crude for orb weavers down at this level. And then also the, the width of the stream somewhat controls for the, the area of these transects. But, but yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I couldn't figure out a really good way to do that because these places were really dense. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, when I made these transects, it was basically if I got to a place and there was a single spider there or more, right? As soon as I saw a spider, then it seemed like that would be suitable habitat and I would, I would do a transect there. And there were other places with you know, nearly no vegetation that you go to and there's no spiders. So it was sort of um, easy to say that there's no structure there or, or assume that that is worse habitat. But no, that, that's a good point. And, uh, not All right, well, uh, thanks, that was great. And there are a few other questions in the chat. Okay. So I hope you can take a look at that. Uh, thanks, Gilman. Um,